Enjoy the convenience of seven days a week banking and extended hours with Cube from First Arkansas Bank and Trust. Member FDIC. It's time for From the Short Grass with Trey Shap, a golf podcast for those who love golf, struggle with golf, and just like to enjoy the outdoors and fellowship with friends, all while chasing a ball around trying to put it in a four and a quarter inch diameter hole. From the Short Grass is brought to you by Blackman Auctions. For over 80 years, better auctions have always been Blackman Auctions. By MinnowsPlus.com. From baits to waiters, if it helps you catch a fish, they have it. And now, from the short grass, here is your host, Trey Shap. Welcome to another edition of From the Short Grass. I think you are going to love hearing from this year's Arkansas State Amateur Champion and graduate senior for the Arkansas Razorbacks, Luke Long, in this episode. We will get to Luke in a bit. But first, congratulations to Tony Finau, who won the first leg of the FedEx Cup playoffs in an actual playoff over Cameron Smith. Smith fired an 11-under 60 in round three of the Northern Trust to vault up the leaderboard, but all players had to wait out Hurricane Henri, and the PGA Tour postponed round four till Monday. And that is when Finau made his move, firing a 6-under 65 over the final 18 holes to make the playoff with Smith and then prevailed in the playoff after Smith rinsed his tee shot into the Hudson River that borders Liberty National. Now, Finau shot a 30 on the back nine to finish at minus six. Finau won on the PGA Tour for the first time since 2016 when he won the Puerto Rico Open. The Women's Open Championship was being held at Carnoustie in Scotland this weekend, and as the leader was putting for par on the 18th hole, for some strange reason, NBC Sports, who has the broadcasting rights, cut to their, quote, playing through, where they put the action on the left side of your screen and run commercials on the other side. Are you kidding me? This is a major championship, and this happens? It would never happen in a men's major, period. Congrats to Anna Norquist for firing a four-day total of 12 under 276 and winning by one. When we come back, 2021 Arkansas amateur Luke Long will be on the tee. Don't forget, if you need new frog togs outerwear for your hunting season, check out minnowsplus.com. We are back after this. This is Thomas Blackman with Blackman Auctions. Trey asked me to sponsor a show for another few months. Even though I don't like golf, I do like his show. I have no idea how he gets the awesome variety of guests on his show, but it is entertaining and informative even for a horrible golfer like myself. I'm learning a lot about the game and about the passion for playing. So much so, I've started using my country club for more than Sunday brunch. Trey makes golf interesting. I make auctions interesting. For auctions, listen to me. For golf, listen to Trey. Since 1938, better auctions are Blackman Auctions. Minnows Plus is your local source for live bait and live well supplies. They carry the entire line of SureLife products, everything from better bait and finer shiner to no ammonia products to keep your bait and your catch thriving till you get back to the dock. They are the best source for all your private land ponds. Minnows Plus has fish food and pond fertilizer to keep your pond healthy and thriving all year long. If you own or run a bait and tackle shop and need to resupply, contact Minnows Plus and ask about their wholesale prices. Open to the public and walk-ins are welcome. Find them on the web at MinnowsPlus.com. Welcome back to From the Short Grass. Now on the tee, the 2021 Arkansas Amateur Champion and Arkansas Razorback, Luke Long. Luke, thanks for sitting down and joining us on From the Short Grass. Congratulations on the win at Pleasant Valley, your second state am. Which one was better, the win at Texarkana a couple years ago or the win at PV just this this year. Well, your first one's always special to you, but this year I think the win the the, the win this year was real um, was good for me because I'd been struggling a little bit in the past and been trying struggling to you know put together some good rounds and starting the day um, five back and going out and getting the low one and being able to finish off making birdies on sixteen and eighteen to uh, win by one was big for me because the first first two rounds I'd rinsed one in the water on seventeen made double and then hit one in the water on sixteen in the second round. And made double and was coming in those holes three and four under. So 
didn't really close out any anything and then um just putting one together was uh what got it for me for those that don't realize how difficult of a finish it is at pleasant valley they call it around the lake there's a big lake or pond but more of a lake and you've got to play 16 which is a par four 17 is a par three a long par three and then 18 is a par five and it's all water on the left side of you when you play those holes how difficult is it to go around the lake especially the way you did on saturday in two under it, it's tough it's really tough for me because you had the wind kind of coming in off your uh right side coming up 16 and i'm i'm a draw player my tendency is to to pull one or to over over draw one so i was aimed up pretty nice in the trees just playing for um, an accidental pull just to kind of get away with one uh, and i pulled driver um, and then squeeze one up in the rough and then 17 you're coming down i was aimed up in the cart path because you had the wind straight up off the right and just uh hit a big old draw in there and just cut my losses and try and make get a two puck so we got the pin all the way in the back playing 245 you know you're not getting one in there tight without pulling off a great really really good shot and then um you got 18 with the water up the left and the bunker up the right and you got to kind of squeeze one in there uh, if you want to get down there and i happen to get a pretty fortunate bounce it bounced right in front of the bunker and then bounced uh, up and through into the rough so i was able to get a second shot kind of up by the green not on but around and get a get a chip did you try to go for the green in two or were you trying to lay up short because in that just beyond those bunkers there on the right side of 18 you could get a flyer lie out of that bermuda grass right yeah so i was uh i had 245 to the pin and then about 230 to the front edge and i had a pretty pretty decent lie and um i wasn't trying to get get at the green because i was a little bit uh ball below my feet and i pulled two iron just to try and get one up and close. And if I tugged it or overdrew it, it might dribble up there and on. And then just kind of hit a hit a cut up there in between those bunkers and um, was right up against the front lip of one and then had to pick a pretty good 58 degree up there and get it chasing down towards the hole. I got up there about 10 feet and then uh, cashed in the putt. You've had success at Pleasant Valley. You must like that course. You won the high school overall there, and now you've won a state am there. How much do you love playing Pleasant Valley? Man, I love Pleasant Valley a lot. It's I think it's one of the best golf courses in the state. If not, you know, my it, it, it's probably got an argument for best course um, in the state. And if you hear, like, you talk to some of the members out there, they're a little bit disappointed uh, at the course condition this week. Even though I thought it was perfect, they were like, "Man, I was hoping they get the greens uh, a little bit firmer and faster." I was like, "I mean, how much uh, how much faster do you want them to be?" Because I thought they were stemped in probably about twelve, twelve and a half, and then. You know, Doug Ford, the president, he was like, man, they're not, they're not as brutal as they, as, as they can be. They can get them rolling 14s. And I was like, shoot, man, I don't know uh, how many guys want to come out here and battle 14s, especially those guys in the Masters division that can't, can't spin the ball. And so I don't want to get out there. I'm already breathing on putts down, uh, downhill. But the course is great. It, it's got everything you'd ever want. Like, it's, uh, it's tree-lined. And the best thing about it is, though, is when they did the redesign, they put bunkers in, like, real nice places, took on some trees, took away some trees, and just did a really good job. I mean, anytime you got a golf course that you got almost infinite amount of options off the tee, it, it's great. I mean, you can drive or four iron, two iron, three wood, whatever you want to do. You be aggressive, lay back, play conservative. I mean, it's got everything you'd ever want. You've had some success here lately in the state am. You runner up last year at Hot Springs Country Club and I know it was supposed to be at Hart Scrabble last year, but because of COVID, Hot Springs stepped in. It's gonna be at Hart Scrabble next year. That's where where you will get to uh, defend down in Fort Smith. Winning in, in eighteen at Texarkana Country Club, runner up last year, winning this year. What is it about the state am that gets Luke Long fired up and going? Uh, well, uh, I think one thing that gets me fired up is that I've just grown up around all the all the people um, that you're playing against. You know, see them every year at all the same tournaments, a big tournament, biggest tournament of the year. You know, you're not prepping for you try to prep for every tournament the same, but I mean, the state am in Arkansas means a little bit a little bit more. You know, being from here, and then you're all you're around your friends, you're playing with your buddies. You know, you want to see them play good, and they want to see you play good, and you obviously want to play good. But you know, just kind of having that title of being the the Arkansas champ for the year and then you know people kind of knowing who you are and then you show up and you're you know people expect you to play good and then being able to produce it's 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 just a good 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 feeling let's go back to when you were growing up when did you first pick up a golf club I started playing when I was about five six years old I started playing because I had a a pretty serious head injury whenever I was uh, five years old I fell off a like a high diving board and had a, a pretty serious concussion 
and then wasn't able to do any type of physical activity uh, for about a year. And so almost every day in the summer, I'd go play uh, putt-putt at Gator Golf and was just out there grinding, learning the blue and the red course up there. They got 36, and it eventually started wanting to get into real golf. And at the time, my dad um, was in the banking industry, and he was playing a decent amount, so he'd take me out whenever we go to the pool up at Fable Country Club. And i grab my club and just go sit on the range and beat balls uh, up the left side and try Happy Gilmore and all that kind of kind of stuff. And then uh, started playing tournaments when I was about nine years old and then playing against a guy named Philip Barbary down in uh, Shreveport. I teed up against him, and he beat me by 25 shots the first round and then I think another 20-plus the next. And I was like, God, who is this guy? I shot 96 at Hot Springs Park course, and he shot 69. I was like, what's going on? Yeah, he's a stud. Oh, he's great. You know, you see, he was he was the man growing up junior golf. Still see him, see his name pop up every now and again. Played really good for LSU. And then he just started his professional career, and I think he's doing pretty good. Yeah. So when you are watching golf on television and as a kid, who did you follow? Who did you try to pattern your game after, if anyone? Man, obviously you see Tiger up there a lot, but um, – the big guy for me was is, is uh, Jim Furyk, a big Jim Furyk fan. Man, he doesn't do anything like super special. Just get just rock solid. Owns his game. Gets the ball in the hole. Knows how to go low. Can really do whatever he wants with a golf ball. You know, people always kind of you know dog on a swing. Um, but I like his swing. If you look at it, it's really good from like ninety to ninety, hip to hip. He just keeps a club face as square as anyone. Um, out there and I wouldn't say he's underrated but I mean later in his career I think people kind of wrote him off a little bit and he uh when he fired the 58 the Travelers a couple years ago I was fired up just trying to find all the feed of that and they I was pretty sour whenever they didn't uh have any of his front nine whenever I think he shot eight or nine under and then they had his back nine coverage but I was fired up for that growing up in northwest Arkansas and Fayetteville in particular there's some good golf courses up here that you can hone your craft on Take me back to Fayetteville Country Club and first time you went out there and, and played, and what do you remember about that? Man, first time at Fayetteville Country Club or growing up at um, Fayetteville Country Club, uh, it was just good. I didn't realize um, when you're younger, you don't you know, bomb the ball. So it was, um, it, was, it was pretty good length for when I was younger and then just being able to figure out what you can and can't do and learn and, like, how you just – you learn how to put spin on the ball and just uh, all, all the basics uh, really came out of there um, that just kind of like molded molded the game. And being out there, if you want to go low, you get to drive the ball really well, I think. So that's what – and that's 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 been a big foundation for my game. I've always been a pretty good driver of the golf ball, and it kind of goes back to there. And then uh, good iron play is always key out there too. But one thing I could never do was chip around the grain there. It was brutal. I just – putt from 15 20 yards off the green just to avoid stubbing it or grab seven irons and it banks in there and then going out with your buddies and just playing 18 we used to not be able to get on until two o'clock when you were younger and out there and walk so you had to you know make good use of your time while you could because someone rolled up behind you you're letting them play through and then just every shot counts because you know how long you're going to be out there whether it's going to be nine or what if you're young if they're going to pull you off the course they got a, a, a little scotch for some event so it's just making the most of your time. You played in the last two U.S. Amateurs, didn't make it this year. What were those like, and how did they help you improve your game? What did they teach you about your game? E- each one taught me something different. Uh, any Those those USGA setups are tough. They're brutal. Pinehurst number 2 was my first kind of introduction to, oh, my God, this is this is really hard. Like we, my, my, my caddy and I were talking, he'd played on the corn Ferry tour for a little while and we were looking at the setup and stuff and we were like, man, I don't know why someone would come out here and pay $200 around to just get punched in the face every hole. And so we just, uh, had to really plot ourselves around the golf course cause it was playing long. It was playing firm. It was fast. And they had the pins tucked on the sides, three, four, five off the side and they're all turtle back or they all mm-hmm. got run run off so they're really cutting them down so you really only got two or three on each side so they get really tight um and then just being able to position yourself correctly around that golf course was the biggest thing because you know you miss a green we got up over a chip and we're like hey where do we want to leave this and then i remember him telling me he's like all right we want to leave this 10 feet short 
And I was like, 10 feet short, are you sure? I mean, we just run this one up there, you know, try and tap in for four, get out of here. And then he's like, we'll go take a look at behind the pin and then on the other side of the green because it was just a couple. There's it was, it was only had three, we only had like five, six feet behind it. And then go up there, look at the pin. You're like, all right, you're right. This thing runs down into a gully of death. So right. <laughs> dump it out there 10, 15 feet short, roll up there, tapping for five, go to the next. And then when you got to Bandon Dunes last year, Man, the wind was pumping from the get go. That was probably one. That was probably one of my best rounds. Is my first round uh, there. Wake up, have the afternoon tea time. You got peak winds. You teeing off. You're hitting four iron, three hundred and twenty yards down the middle of the fairway, and you step on the next hole and you grab seven iron from two twenty and hit it to the back of the green, and then you just navigate all the way around the golf course and in the trees when you're playing the trail side, and then you come around to eighteen and you got straight back in the wind. And you go from hitting seven iron from 220 on the second hole to pulling seven iron from 120 on the last hole, and not even getting it to the green. So it just teaches you how to like hone, hone just hone your craft, and you gotta put together shots when you can. You're putting from all over the place, hitting shots you wouldn't, you'd never think you'd have to hit. You know, I pulled five iron from 100 yards and just like punched one up because it, it was the only play I had from the middle of the fairway. So right. I was afraid of dumping it in the bunker or hitting it in the high stuff. The blessings up here, the home course for the University of Arkansas. What does it afford a golfer like you that wants to play at that highest level to work on your craft and get better? I kind of molded my game around being able to play blessings well because that was my big uh, – that's I you know, play there every day. And it, it it's just very demanding, like every shot, like you can't take a single shot off or else you're going to pay for it. And the biggest thing that's helped me is being able to be comfortable with stepping up on a tough tee ball and being able to execute. Because out there, if you don't, if you can't get the ball and, and play or dodge the bunkers or, you know, you got to take on some risk of running it up uh, along a hazard versus, you know, laying back and having 170, you got to take on some risk to have a wedge in um especially if it's windy out there uh, just being able to pull off shots like that under pressure with you know the alternatives double or bogey or whatever it might be is uh really valuable or has been valuable to me out there and then learning how to hit it into pockets and hitting your numbers with clubs from you know 20 to 200 and then not, and then learning how to go low on tough golf courses, and once you get it rolling, just to keep keep it rolling. Mm-hmm. Can this team, this Arkansas golf team, can they win a national championship this year? Absolutely, I think we've got a lot of the right pieces for this for this team. We just got another transfer in from uh, Texas Christian University, a guy named Mateo Fernandez. He's an Argentinian guy. He's he's one of the best, if not the best player or uh, amateur player in Argentina, and he just gets it done week in, week out. He just made the cut at the USAM uh, this week. I think he finished tied for 23rd uh, in the stroke play portion. Now, that's a huge uh, – that's a big add for us. And then you got Segundo Pinto, who was another transfer. He won the SEC championship last year. Mm-hmm. He might be one of the best, if not the best drivers of the golf ball in college golf, and he just – sits there and stripes it all day and he's got the capacity to take it really low and then you got the proven guy uh julian perico he's got all the firepower stripes it all day he's got and he can get it going go low he's won a handful of times in college and then um had a really nice amateur career he's another good piece he he i think he's got the lowest scoring average in uh arkansas history uh for a single season a couple years ago and then um I like to think I can shuffle in there and help the guys out. And then uh, Will Gibson from Jonesboro, Arkansas, he's got a lot of good game. He can shuffle in and help the team out. And there's about five guys um, good on the list that can really, really help us out going down the stretch. We all have their own unique skill set that um, if someone, you know, steps up or starts shaving maybe a shot around off, they can really, really do some good damage. What's next for you after this year? Obviously most – College golfers want to make it to the PGA Tour. Plans to turn pro for you? Yeah, absolutely. Plans to turn pro. I'd like to. Uh, I'm gonna. I guess sit down with my parents uh, 
here in a couple months and try and uh, schedule out what we want to do and uh, put together uh, some kind of plan for Q School. A couple of years ago, my initial uh, my initial desire was to actually go over to China and try to do uh, PGA Tour China, uh, just because uh, I gotten I know a couple guys that had done it and they said. Um, a lot of the guys are just afraid to make the jump to go over there, and it's not that the fields are any any weaker, but they uh, reserve player reserve some spots for some, uh, we'll say Asian players that might not be as good. So you, you you're competing against really, I guess, a, a smaller field of guys for uh, top level points, and then so I don't know what that looks like right now because China's not in the best of shape as far as uh, letting people in and out. So I'll, I'll probably look at doing either the form tour or the. Uh, PGA Latin America uh, for this upcoming next summer and then try and shuffle into the uh, Corn Ferry Tour uh, final or Corn Ferry Tour. Well, Luke, it's good to have you back in the state. Good to have you representing the Razorbacks and being a hog. And I know growing up here, probably in the back of your mind, you always thought, man, I, I want to be a Razorback at, at some point. It might have been tough to go away, but everything comes full circle is what I always say. And you're here now congratulations again on winning the state am this year and good luck up here in Fayetteville appreciate it Trey it's great to be here this is Thomas Blackman of Blackman Auctions Trey asked me to sponsor a show for another few months even though I don't like golf I do like a show I have no idea how he gets the awesome variety of guests on his show but it's entertaining and informative even for a horrible golfer like myself I'm learning a lot about the game and about the passion for playing so much so I've started using my country club for more than Sunday brunch Trey makes golf interesting. I make auctions interesting. For auctions, listen to me. For golf, listen to Trey. Since 1938, better auctions are Blackman Auctions. Minnows Plus is your local source for live bait and live well supplies. They carry the entire line of SureLife products, everything from better bait and finer shiner to no ammonia products to keep your bait and your catch thriving till you get back to the dock. They are the best source for all your private land ponds. Minnows Plus has fish food and pond fertilizer to keep your pond healthy and thriving all year long. If you own or run a bait and tackle shop and need to resupply, contact Minnows Plus and ask about their wholesale prices. Open to the public and walk-ins are welcome. Find them on the web at minnowsplus.com. Welcome back to From the Swordgrass. Since 1938, better auctions have always been Blackman Auctions. Find them on the web at blackmanauctions.com. Now on the tee with our weekly rules segment, here is master PGA professional Adam Carney. Adam, what's the difference between an amateur and a professional according to the rules? Well, I mean, according to the rules, an an amateur is someone that, that plays the game for the love of the game, right? Um, a professional is somebody that that plays the game to make a living. It's really that simple. What we consider to be amateurs today is probably not the same consideration they had a hundred years ago. But back when the game was invented and and through the first hundred years or so, did we have professionals? Yes, we have professionals. But if you were a caddy in Scotland, you were considered a quote unquote professional. Mm-hmm. Um, and the best players in the world were amateurs, and amateurs won every major. And you can you think about the last great amateur. Amateur Bobby Jones that won the the Grand Slam all four majors in one year well you have to remember those four majors did not include the PGA Championship or the Masters right they were the United States Open the US Amateur the British, British Open, Open the, British the British Amateur, Amateur. And so that was the Grand Slam. So the the game was t- tier, it was 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 made toward amateurs. So yeah, I mean the amateur game dominated forever and then what you started seeing was professionals um some amateurs realized that they could make a living you know really just going from town to town and playing exhibitions more than anything else it wasn't so much playing competitions but um the game revolved around amateur golf and obviously fast forward to you know now it's 2021 the best players in the world are without question professionals you look at the evolution of tournament prize purses undoubtedly increased by the likes of tiger woods and his presence as a world player you don't see that many players of that caliber remain amateurs for a long time i mean one of the greatest amateurs i think ever was a guy named jay siegel from pennsylvania a uh, state amateur i can't remember what jay did specifically i want to say insurance uh won the usam won all kinds of amateur events played in masters it seems like he's in the u.s open every single 
school year. But when he turned 50, decided to go play on, at with that time, I believe it was still called the Senior Tour. Right. Um, now it's called PGA Tour Champions. He decided, hey, you know, I played I'm as an amateur yeah. my whole life. Time to make some money. Time to make some money. Now we see even junior players that are amateurs now are thinking, hey, I want to get to be a professional as quickly as possible. We, we, we still have a few that don't go to college and try to turn professional immediately. And, and some I, go to college and then they turn professional either right after or even before even, they don't finish before. college. They don't finish. But the rules, you know, regarding amateur status have changed dramatically. I mean, essentially, uh, the simple rule was you can't take, you know, cash, quote unquote, money for your performance in a tournament. You could take merchandise or credit, things like that. And at, at one time, you couldn't take any assistance whatsoever to help you pay expenses. Well, that has all changed now. Um, it's changed dramatically because now junior players have not necessarily contracts, but agreements with equipment, apparel, footwear manufacturers, where they're giving them the equipment. Um, you, it's okay if you have a, a talented junior player that has a family maybe without great means, and now somebody is funding that young man or woman to go play um, competitively across the country. Those were, you know, used to be amateur status violations, and now they're not, which is obviously a, a good decision to make. Um, they're not making a living playing golf. And we've also seen where professionals can get their amateur status back. And now the process is a little bit faster than mm-hmm. what it used to be. Yeah, it is. And, and you know, I, I think you're gonna, you see that mostly in the club professional ranks. Um, you know, for myself, for example, I'm, I'm 50 years old. I, I really don't, I don't compete anymore. Um, I'm retired as a, as a club professional. I still do some things um, on a volunteer basis for the PGA, but uh, you know, I could get my amateur status back, but you know, for me, I'm a life member. I worked hard to be a, a, a PGA member. I worked hard to become a master professional and get my certifications. It, it seems like to throw all that away is 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 useless. But yes, there is there is a road back if somebody gets into the golf business. You know, for example, one of the things that would disqualify somebody from being an amateur is teaching and being compensated to teach. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, you get into that 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 career path and then you decide you know i've got a great opportunity going to work for xyz corporation i've been a professional for 12 years but it's time for a life change and uh yes there are there are means by which they can can return to amateur golf real quick before we um run out of time let's say i go out with the guys we've got let's say a 50 dollar nassau it's an entry, entry fee, right? Do I have to give up my amateur status? <laughs> so the USGA does allow, well, we're talking about gambling, pure and simple. So uh, <laughs> they they do allow gambling to an extent, you know, obviously. Is there a certain figure that you can't go over? Well, you know, I don't think that's ever been written down. I, you know, you know, small game. I, I, I can't remember. There's, there's something in the amateur status in the old decisions book that talked about you know, uh, gambling on one's ability at, you know, for a marginal amount of money. But, you know, what what's marginal amount of money to you and I versus Michael Jordan, you know? Or so, Charles Barkley, a guy that's not very good at golf right. but loves to gamble. Right, yeah. Charles Charles loves to gamble, not very good at golf. Better get a good partner, right? <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, the the US, I, I don't think you're ever going to see. I mean, I, the, the last one I can remember was there was a uh, a guy in Vegas, can't remember his name. Um, that was a huge, huge gambler, but he would gamble on anything. Um, and, and in golf, he, he would play for millions of dollars, and USGA said, well, you know, you're not an amateur. And, you know, you're obviously. a professional gambler is yeah, what you are. Yeah, he's a professional gambler. Um, and th- and there, were, there are other instances of amateur players that were prof- professional gamblers that were deemed to be professionals. I sure. Th- I think maybe even Alan Doyle one time was, was deemed to be a professional for a short period of time. Um, and then one thing to note, you know, you know, there was a time that Bobby Jones was actually a professional, um, that, uh, it came from a lot of the, uh, TV stuff he was doing. Some of those old videos right, he was doing right. where he was being compensated for that and didn't think it was fair and actually became, a, I believe came, became a member of the PGA and the USGA quickly, uh, changed that rule for him because there was no way they were going to let the greatest amateur of all time not be an amateur for life. Exactly, yeah. exactly. He's Adam Carney. He's with us every week right here on From the Short Grass. If you've got a question about the rules of golf, you can email us, from the shortgrass at gmail.com. That will do it for this edition of From the Short Grass. I leave you with this golf quote from legendary teacher Harvey Pinnock. Golf tips are like aspirin. 
One may do you good, but if you swallow the whole bottle, you will be lucky to survive. I hope you enjoy your next round, and when you reach the green and find your ball mark, fix it and repair a couple of more, and I hope to see you from the short grass. You've been listening to From the Short Grass, a weekly podcast dedicated to the game of golf. From the Short Grass is brought to you by MinnowsPlus.com and Blackman Auctions. This has been a presentation of the Buzz Radio Network.